At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Welcome again to another Drug Science Podcast. And with me today is a man who could honestly be called the godfather of medical cannabis in Britain, Mike Barnes. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm not sure about the godfather. It sounds rather sinister, but I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Uh, well, at some point, it's going to be seen as celebratory, I'm sure. And okay, that's good. <laughs> so, Mike, I'd like to start these interviews by getting people to tell us a little bit about their background and, or, you know, yeah. you know where you've come from, where you came into medicine, where you got to where you were before you started stirring the, uh, the establishment up about cannabis. So why don't you tell us, give us a bit about your background. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I was uh, born in uh, northeast London. Don't panic, I'm not going to go through a long, drawn-out childhood history here. Uh, but basically, at school, I, I didn't really want, I had no ideas to do medicine. There's, it didn't run in the family. Actually, my particular interest was biochemistry. But uh, some bright spark school careers person said, to way into biochemistry, my boy, is through medicine. So I went into medicine without really knowing anything about it. He was quite wrong. But in one sense, he was quite right. Of course, when I got to do a bit of biochemistry as a medical student, I didn't like it at all. So fortunately, that, that career was spared me. And then I uh, medicine, I picked neurology. If I'm honest, I think it was because it was the more difficult thing to get into, which sort of, I don't know what that says about me. It's probably a stubborn streak. And I enjoyed it. But it was difficult to get into in those early days. But I was lucky enough to, to do that and got into clinical neurology up in Newcastle where I still live, which was a very good neurological centre with a guy called Lord John Walton, who was a very um, powerful mentor, really. Then uh, I enjoyed neurology, but I didn't enjoy that much about the, the general day-to-day, -day, frankly, rather tedious neurology clinics, uh, with great respect to the people who come to them, but they were full of people with headaches and funny spells, and I didn't really, didn't really excite me day after day, so... I became interested in, if you like, management of chronic disability. So my MD was actually, oddly, I seem to have specialised in odd things, uh, was on the use of hyperbaric oxygen for um, use in multiple sclerosis. We had a, one of those diving chambers in Newcastle, which was sitting there doing very little with two technicians sitting around waiting for a diving emergency, which came you know, once every three months or something. And so they, they gave us it to use as a compression chamber for multiple sclerosis. And that, I think, made me realise that as a, neuro a straight diagnostic neurologist, and neurologists were, and still are, mainly diagnostic animals rather than treating people, I realised that you didn't really deal with the people as I'd like to deal with them. You, you, they came to the clinic, they came as an inpatient, you told them they got some awful diagnosis like motor neuron disease or multiple sclerosis, and they said, what can we do about that? And he said, well, it's nothing really, see you in six months. And that's really not too much of an exaggeration. And I learned from that hyperbaric work that actually there's a lot more you can do for people's disability and their quality of life than neurology was offering. So I went from there into neurological rehabilitation, which wasn't really a recognized entity in those days. It is now, I'm pleased to say. And I set up something called the World Federation of Neuro Rehabilitation in its very early days, which has now uh, grown, to, it's got about 50 national societies now and about four or 5,000 members and holds a big conference. So it, it's new rehab is now on the map, as it were, as a recognized neurological subspecialty. So it was nice to do that. And then, um, shall I just keep going here, Dave? Uh, keep, <laughs> you can keep, yeah, I was going to say, I have to say, people may not know this, I'm not sure, but I had the same experience. I, I did neurology and then one afternoon, after sitting in an outpatient clinic at St. Mary's for four hours, yeah. monitoring people slowly declining with their um, multiple sclerosis and their motor neuron disease, and realizing there's nothing I could do, I thought, no, no, it's... Uh, and I moved to psychiatry because 
there the treatments yeah. actually do work and they work pretty, pretty quickly as well yes yeah exactly well i didn't know we shared that same early history i suppose then cannabis in terms of cannabis that goes back 20 plus years i was specializing really in multiple sclerosis and the management of spasticity using uh, the early use of uh, botox which of, uh, people might not know it's now well known as a sort of uh, de wrinkler but actually of course it started off its medical life as a as a perfectly good and valid treatment for spasticity to relax muscles that are in spasm so i did that in the very early days actually i like to say it's a story that i'm sure no one will believe but it is true that we would i was doing it for hemifacial spasm which uh, people might not know is a twitching on the half of the face and i noticed that when we were injecting for half of that face that was twitching that face then became wrinkle free. And so I thought we better, it would be unfair to send someone out with their hemifacial spasm cured, but their wrinkles only half cured. So I started to inject tiny doses for the wrinkles on the other side of the face. And this was well before its, uh, its discovery as an anti wrinkle treatment. I, what I really should have done is patented that, and then I wouldn't you be talking to you now. You <laughs> certainly should. No, you'd be funding drug science now. <laughs> I would be funding drug science living on a yacht somewhere. So I make claim, probably people would dispute it, but I make the claim to discovering wrink the wrinkle-free uh, applications of Botox. There you go. Anyway, that was 20 years ago. I believe you, Michael. I believe I, yeah, thousands wouldn't. But <laughs> <laughs> So I was approached then by uh, GW Pharma. I don't know quite how they found me, probably from the publications of Spasticity, to help with the development of Sativex. And as uh, you and um, I'm sure the audience know, Sativex was the first licensed cannabis medicine, a combination of CBD and THC in equal-ish proportions. And I was their um, expert that signed off the dossier to what is now the MHRA. I think it was called something different back then. Finally got it through them and... You know, and great credit to GW because they, they were very much ahead of their ahead of their time by a long way. And Jeffrey Guy, who ran it, I think, has, has had a great credit for the early development of medical cannabis. So you were an early convert to the concept. Yeah, I'm interested in why. I mean, what made you think that cannabis might be useful? Well, it was uh, the patients coming to the clinic, and uh -huh. uh, they told me somebody out the blue said i'm using cannabis and it's really helping my pain and spasticity i thought I, I thought i'd better tell you and a couple of people said that and after two people have said it totally spontaneously and, and provoked i then asked everyone who came to the clinic just out of pure curiosity i, sh I never published it actually i just said are you using and about 50 percent of the people coming to the clinic which was i forget the numbers something like 80 people with ms in that clinic in newcastle in those days uh, we're using um, cannabis, so they told me. And there might have been others who weren't happy to tell me, but they said it's helping. And I thought, well, if these people are going to criminalise themselves, and they were people with severe disability, of course, who wouldn't be easy to obtain cannabis illegally in no, those days, no. I thought well, there must be something to this. And it was around that time that, again, out the blue, GW approached me. So I thought they put those two things together. I'm very happy to help and see where it goes. And at that time, was there a sense in which the mixture, the balance mixture, I mean, so for those who don't know, Sativex is a kind of balanced mixture, isn't it, of THC and yeah. CBD, about three milligrams each for each spray, I think, isn't that right? Yeah, two point something rather from each spray, that's right, yes. Was that a sort of logic to that, or was it just they thought, well, not sure which works, so let's give a bit of both? I think, to be honest, I've never asked um, the guys that, but I think it was a guess. It had to be a guess because there was virtually no work done in those days. And I think they probably knew some back background from animal models that THC and CBD were both muscle relaxants. So they said, well, let's put them both together. In equal, I don't think there was any more logic to it than that, to be quite honest. Their guess was reasonable. You know, the Sativex works, obviously. It's a licensed medicine. It's not that brilliant for management of spasticity. But it's a very good, very useful fine tuner. So you still use other things, other usually benzodiazepine based, but it's a very good fine tuner. So, you know, well done to them. They, they guessed reasonably right. But it was also a, a very, as I recall, because I was on the CSM at the time, and I recall talking to people from the challenge of doing the studies were really enormous because of the, um, yes. it was a scheduled drug. And then every pharmacy that was, got your supply from had to have a, a schedule one license it was an enormously challenging studies to do 
It was, and the studies at first weren't wildly positive either. So they had to design it. So they got the. Well, I don't don't mean that. <laughs> I don't mean they fiddled the results in any way. But they had to design the studies very carefully to make sure they were positive in the right direction. It was it was very difficult. And then, of course, the nail in that early coffin was the nice decided that it wasn't cost effective. And mm. I think they were probably right. It was quite expensive for the benefit it gave people. And so it really wasn't used in the UK, um, out with a very few research studies and privately. But it was it was used across the world. It was licensed in Canada for pain as well as spasticity, for example, and it's now widely used. But it didn't really take off in the UK until very recently. Is that an example of... Uh... The Brits not really appreciating innovation in their own country. I mean, a British scientists discovered half of the components of the cannabis plant, Roger Burtwee, and yet we've hardly managed to yes. put anyone through the market. Have we? I think you're right, Dave. Yes, it was uh, other countries. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of British inventions are not taken forward after the inventing stage, are they, in the UK, sadly. And I think that could be another example. It was picked up abroad much, much more than it was in the UK. So that was my intro, yes. Yeah. And you saw it was safe because you obviously, you know, yes. it's got through the CSM. And I remember actually sitting on the CSM as it was being presented. You might even have been in the room, Mike, actually. In the yeah, I did present to the CSM, yes. They, they put me forward as the sort of uh, unbiased, independent expert who wasn't part of the company. I was never employed by them. I was just an expert. So, I, yes, I might have persuaded you to pass it through the committee, maybe. <laughs> Well, there was, I mean, it was uh, the concern, as you know, I thought the efficacy didn't look bad in both pain and um, suppose there was this concern about the um, adverse effect, the sort of weird psychological effects. And mm. I remember the discussion about that. But because uh, in those days, we didn't know that CBD had a, a moderating effect on, on THC, did we? It was, no, uh, that's right. That's right. These discoveries came later. Yes, yes. Well, it did get through in the end. I think there were several presentations to go back and get more studies, and it took a good couple of years to get it through. But, you know, great credit to everyone who did actually get through. Absolutely. So then you were on the, uh, your final path then, were you on the cannabis path? Yeah, it was a, a slippery downhill slope from that point onwards. <laughs> well, tell us about that, because it's, it's obviously uh, it's been uh, interesting if, uh, and I guess to some extent rewarding, but challenging. Yeah, uh, well... After the side effects, I think it was about 20 years ago, then I said, nothing much happened. And I didn't particularly use it because it was, I was pure, pure full-time NHS and I wasn't really able to use it. And so nothing really happened in my cannabis history till about five years ago now. Then I was approached again by Molly Meacher, who then I think still is the chair of the all-party parliamentary group on drug policy reform. Uh, out the blue again, I don't know how they alighted on me. And they said, would you mind doing a sort of a study of the overall efficacy of cannabis? And could you do it in the next month? Which was a fairly, uh, so it's strange. I found myself saying yes. She's a very persuasive woman. I've never been able to say no to Molly. No, I, I was, <laughs> didn't think to be a choice in the matter, frankly. But I did it with my daughter. My daughter is a, a doctorate of psychology. So she wrote mainly the side effects sections of that report. But it was fun doing it. it. When we did do it in a month, we looked at something like 20,000 references. I, I don't claim to have read all of them, but I, I do claim to have looked at them, at least in abstract form. And it was good. I mean, a lot of it, some of it I knew and a lot of it I didn't know at the time. Because my background was neurology, as I've said, so I didn't really know much about its psychiatric applications, let alone Crohn's disease or, or whatever else uh, that uh, was there at the time. But that came out. I think it was reasonably influential in the sense that nothing much had been done like that before, five, even five years ago. And it sort of, nothing happened immediately, but then it got some traction. And it's one of those things, Dave, where you, you're the only person who's written something, therefore you're the, automatically the expert because there's no one else to go to. That's happened a couple of times in my strange career, particularly Botox. So without claiming any great expertise, having been the only person who'd written anything, then I was asked to talk at this and talk at that. And then again, out the blue, everything just happened out the blue. I was approached by a guy called Peter Carroll from Endar Payne, which was uh, early days of that campaign. And uh, Peter and the Endar Payne campaign were trying to raise awareness and get cannabis prescribed in the UK mainly despite the title for children with epilepsy. I never quite understood why they called it. Well, that's right. Just say a little bit. Yes. People may not understand that what that group is, but you could just uh, yeah. 
explain a little bit about that group? I don't know the, the history, why, where it started from, but again, it was Molly Meacher again. I think I wanted uh, the more acceptance of cannabis, really for children with drug-resistant uh, res uh, epilepsy. And so Peter, who is a parliamentary lobbyist, and he does, he's very good at that. He, for example, did the Gurkha campaign, which was a couple of years ago. Yes. So, and he was the ex um, special advisor in the treasury, joined with his colleague, Will DePaya, who's also a special advisor in the treasury. And they came out and formed their own parliamentary lobbying consultancy firm. And they did this pro bono to try and raise awareness of cannabis for children with epilepsy. But then Hannah Deacon came on the frame. She briefly, she'd been across with her son, Alfie, and her partner drew to Holland because uh, Alfie, and I'm sure Hannah won't mind me talking about Alfie briefly. He has a condition of PCDH19, which is a very rare, exceptionally rare form of uh, childhood epilepsy. Uh, he'd had several hundreds of seizures every week, totally unresponsive to medication. The only thing that worked was intravenous steroids. So he went into intense pediatric intensive care unit 48 times in the year before cannabis at a huge cost to the National Health Service. I mean, it's phenomenal. Several hundreds of thousands of pounds that would have cost. Uh, they went to Holland and after a little bit of time found uh, cannabis that effectively stopped his seizures, which is remarkable. It is totally remarkable. They didn't want to live in Holland. They, they live in Midlands and they wanted to come back to the UK because they couldn't come back to the UK because it was illegal. So she joined that campaign to get the prescription for Alfie um, back home. They couldn't find a doctor willing to do it on their own. The neurologists were either very skeptical or basically said, no, if you mention that again, you'll be referred to social services. There was one guy who said that. Another said they would, but was then stopped from doing so by the hospital hierarchy. So Peter uh, landed on me and said, would you do it? Um, it being the application to the Home Office for a Schedule 1 license. So again, I found myself saying yes to that. And that was three months. It was actually quite interesting. And the Home Office, contrary to what people might think, were actually remarkably helpful, remarkably willing to, to listen, uh, to adjust. It was a long, drawn-out process because they'd never done it before. And it did take the intervention of the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, to sort of pull the stops out and get things done. But with that level of support, and through Nick Hurd, was the Minister at the time at the Home Office, uh, we did get it through in about three months it took to get the license and Alfie got his license in summer 18. Now many of the listeners to this podcast are, are well even the UK ones won't quite understand what you're talking about and most of the overseas ones won't have a clue. So, so you have here's a young lad who's got very severe seizures that have been very markedly improved by going to Holland and getting some medical cannabis. Yes. And he wants to have medical cannabis in Britain and then you have to do what to get it? Well, to get it, you could get cannabis legally in the UK prior to the law change under what's called a Schedule 1. It was the Schedule 1 of the Misuse of Drugs Regulations, which meant by definition that it had no medicinal value. You could get a Schedule 1 license to do research on cannabis, but it was difficult and complicated to do so. I, th I believe there were some who did get a research license, but it had never been given out as a license for an individual, for a patient to use as a medicine. So this is the first ever time that they'd issued a Schedule 1 controlled drugs license, which is what you require to handle a Schedule 1 drug. You need a controlled drugs license issued by the Home Office. Uh, you had to have that to handle it and to write a prescription for it. And uh, Alfie's GP actually was the actual prescription writer on the National Health Service. Um, and he's one of the very few who've got a prescription on the National Health Service still, even nearly three years later. But he needed a consultant to develop and, and, and supervise that license. So that, that was me. So I held a, a Schedule 1 controlled drugs license and so did Alfie's GP. So you had to get a special license to yeah. each patient effectively then, would it? Or, or could you, in theory, have prescribed to other people under that license? No, it was a one license for one patient for one month at a time. And that, that was the only license pre-law uh, law change except for one for a child in Northern Ireland who got granted a temporary license roughly the same time but as a result of that and a, a overwhelming media support i show it confirmed to me the power of media david it was nothing to do with science or logic or intellectual debate it's purely what the daily mail or the daily telegraph have to say about things that carries the weight sadly uh, but the press were uniformly behind this campaign bbc the today program 
this morning there's a lot of and hannah is brilliant at media mm. without any training i mean totally brilliant and her campaign combined with the support from the media basically was what got the law changed they got the license in june 18 and the law was changed in november 18 which was remarkably fast actually i mean for, for a change of the law over that period of time was extraordinary and there was this great sense then i remember vividly the sense that job done but in fact yep. of course it wasn't really done at all done at all no i i thought that i was on holiday at the time when the, the, the message came through and i thought well that's it good i can now properly retire but that hasn't quite worked that way because as as we now know of course the, the law changed the the view of most of the medical profession didn't change and indeed hasn't changed so although doctors on the national health service can prescribe cannabis legally now under, under schedule two it moved from schedule one to schedule two with misuse of drugs regulations meaning that you can prescribe it in the same way as any other controlled drug like uh, your know, heroin or any opioids that sort of thing but they haven't caught up and many doctors are still very against it uh, on rather ignorant grounds i have to say because they haven't been trained in it they haven't been educated in it and as i say we've got now three national health service prescriptions two of which were pre-law change so there's only been one post-law change and that's it so it's all now private Over two years it's two years later we've got three prescriptions absolutely yeah let's just reflect a little bit on them so are you still attached to the neurology department in in newcastle no, not really. I have an honorary chair there now, but I've I've retired now as a neurologist. I mean, it's kind of too too much. Do you talk to neurologists? I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> I just find I'm fascinated. So because I mean, you know, as a it must be very disappointing for you. You started off, you know, and you you kind of blazed this trail. You showed that Sativex works, and you've got the law changed, and yet you can't get your colleagues to even listen to you. And, no, no, I don't know what that says about me or them. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, uh, no, the vast. I, it's interesting that I thought the people, with respect to psychiatric colleagues, I thought it would be the psychiatrists who were naively thought they would be the most against it of the medical professions that were interested. I'm not surgeons or whatever are not going to be ever hugely interested, but because they see, of course, they do. They see the cannabis dependency, all the psychotic problems that can come from high THC street cannabis. So I thought the psychiatric body would be the most uh, reluctant to embrace it medically, but that's not the case at all. In fact, it's the opposite. More psychiatrists, I've trained now more psychiatrists than any other group of doctors, followed by pain doctors, but still very few. If, if any, I think uh, neurologists, particularly paediatric neurologists, are really quite awfully difficult. Well, hello, listeners. Uh, apologies for the interruption to the show, but I have a very exciting piece of news to share with you. In December, I will be releasing my brand new book, The Brain and Mind Made Simple. Now, this is a book which has been developed from lectures I gave for drug science over the last couple of years before COVID. They went down very well. I discovered that people were very interested in their brain and very interested in their mind and also interested in the way that drugs, both legal and illegal, cast light on those and, and affect them. So if you're interested in your brain at all, this book will take you from the very beginnings of, you know, when we're in the back in the primordial days, when the, uh, the first animals were developing a nervous system, right through into the current ways in which we can study the brain with imaging and also give you insights into what goes wrong in the brain and there are chapters on all the different ways in which processes of consciousness and the content of consciousness can change with disorders such as depression anxiety schizophrenia and also a big section on sleep as well because that's a fascinating component of brain function which is not well understood now, the book will support drug science and the, in the same way as my previous book, um, Not Uncut, did. And to celebrate the launch of the book, we're hosting a book launch in London. And this will be one of the first real-life events I've done in the past 18 months. And we're very excited to see listeners of the podcast in person at this event. So if you can make your way to London, we'd love to see you there. And, of course, uh, you'll be able to buy the book and you'll have a, get a signed copy from me. But obviously, many of the uh, podcast listeners are from overseas, and we don't want you to miss out. So we'll also uh, host an online book launch as well. Um, if you follow us on the website, you'll know when that's going to be. And again, if you join our community, you'll be able to get special signed copies and also 
other access to other drug science events I'm taking part in. So now back to the show. Well, perhaps we'll come back to that in a minute as to why, why they are. But you, you've started up a whole organization to train doctors. So tell us about that. Yeah, well, I, th- I could see from day one, well, day one after law change, that the main barrier was ignorance. And I, I don't mean that particularly rudely, but the, mm. the doctors hadn't been trained in. Cannabis medicine is rather different from medicine. It's a botanical type of medicine. It do, it's not just like any new antihypertensive or anti-diabetic or whatever. It does need special training. Not difficult, but you do need it. So and there wasn't any existing. So I thought, well, it's, we ought to have some. So I set up the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society which is open, as its as the name implies, to any clinician. It doesn't have to be a doctor who can prescribe. It's any medic, any pharmacist, any health professional, anyone with an interest from the clinical. It's a, health, it's a professional body, in a sense, rather than a patient body. Mm-hmm. Its early task, other than the conference, was to set up a training program, which we did initially, and in fact still to an extent, through a thing called the Academy of Medical Cannabis, which is now part of the LIFE group. But now there are other training programs. And now, of course, as you know, uh, we'll come to probably later, I do a monthly training course with drug science as well as the MCCS. And so the academy is still going. Um, Through that, we've now trained something like 80 doctors, I think. It's a tiny number because I don't know how many doctors are in the UK. But nevertheless, though, I think about half of those are probably actively prescribing now. So probably about 40 active prescribers. And they've prescribed now for about 6,000 patients all bar three privately so i think the key still is education 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 and education as i think tony blair said indeed yes so do you think it will will always be in the in the private sphere then i mean do you think we can break through to get the nhs understanding the value of this in the market but i mean i find it so weird you know you think something at least where you've got such enormous individual patient evidence yeah you know that you picked up very you know 30, 20 odd years ago and you know i still struggle to understand why doctors won't won't embrace patient reports i mean it makes no sense to me at all it doesn't make any sense to me i mean it's it's a remarkable medicine it's and the most important thing it's remarkably safe so the risk benefit analysis however you want to do that is hugely in favor of people with with profound epilepsy, uh, with severe pain, who haven't responded to opioids and, and other medications, those with severe chronic anxiety, with nothing else that standard medicine has to offer, nothing at all. Why on earth don't people embrace this? So, well, okay, even if you're slightly cynical about it, let's try it. It's safe. And listen to the patients. And what I, I think it will change, it will change. There's no doubt. It's an unstoppable movement now. I think it will change because the patients who are now 6,000 and going up month by month will go back to their GP and they'll go back to their consultant and they'll say, look, I'm on this stuff now legally and it's really helping. And I, I hope that some of those doctors will actually listen to the patients, some don't, of course, and say, well, okay, well, perhaps I was wrong or perhaps I didn't know enough about it and I'll try it. And we only need one or two brave souls on the National Health Service to start prescribing. And then, you know, the dominoes begin to fall, don't they? Mm. That will happen. Yes. But it's Britain's been rather slow compared with other countries, hasn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. Do you think it's because of the NHS? Because it is a sort of monolith. There isn't much facility or allowance of individuals to be autonomous in the NHS. Yeah. I think when I was... I'm going to have one of those in my day sort of moments, but I'm... Do it, do it. Do it, yeah. In our in our day, Mike. Oh, okay. In our day, you could actually experiment. I think experiment's perhaps the right word to use. If you had a different technique, it doesn't have to be a different drug or a different surgical technique or a different psychiatric technique, you could try it out. And maybe the freedom of doctors going back 30, 40 years maybe was too much, maybe it needed a little bit more central control because there was surgical techniques that came out that, you know, weren't good for people and they disabled people. I remember a new a new surgical technique, a neurosurgical colleague was trying for subarachnoid hemorrhage, which succeeded in disabling most people who went through the procedure uh, because they came through to me in the brain injury rehab units. So maybe there did need to be some little bit of control on new developments and new initiatives. But nowadays it's almost impossible. And, and cannabis, bizarrely, if a doctor does think he wants to prescribe it, they can't do it until they go to their drug and therapeutics committee or their medical director and say, please, can I do this, sir? And of course, they'll want to cover their 
ask, for, pardon the phrase, and uh, they won't go against nice guidance and that sort of thing. So the answer comes back, no, you can't. And that's that's the end of it. But previously, doctors, I think quite rightly, could say, well, I think this is valuable for my patient. There's nothing else I can offer. I want to try it. And I think it just needs one or two doctors now to say, well, that's what I'm going to do, like it or not. But uh, it, hasn't, it, it hasn't that happened. Well, of course, there is that barrier of the pharmacist, isn't there, as well? And anyway, yes. we created this extra yes. extra level. It used to be that doctors could write prescriptions that weren't vetted and yes. didn't have to go through the uh, the pharmacy approval process. Now it's a bit trickier. And, uh, it is. I don't entirely know why that's happened. No, some of it's right, but I think the, the, the pendulum has swung too far the other direction now. You really can't innovate. And the latest generation mm. of doctors haven't in even the mindset to try and innovate. They've been sort of in, in bred in the NHS restrictive system. You're the doctor, you do as you're told, rather than the other way around. So I think it's partly that. It's it's partly the stigma of cannabis. You know, generations have grown up. To, you know, cannabis is anti-establishment. It's, it, you know, not a drug that can possibly help people. It's a drug that harms people. All that myth is still around, mm. sadly. And I, so I think it's education. And the British medical establishment is not known for being innovative, to be honest. It used to be, but I don't think it is now. No, no, absolutely. I think one of the issues is that um, we set up a, this you know, almost superstructure called NIHR, which is, mm. is an extra, extremely bureaucratic system. And it, it's almost as if they believe that bureaucracy is research. Form of, you know, and it's, we're de-skilling uh, or certainly take, uh, not at least certainly disabling individuals to, mm. to to be innovative and creative and yeah. just the process of going through any kind of nihr system to do anything is it's so enormously tedious and bureaucratic that yeah. you know, most people just get tired of boredom before they even get to the point where they can and it's also expensive as well yes yeah you're absolutely right setting up a study these days the bureaucracy you have to go through the ethics committee and such like i'm not saying you shouldn't go through ethics committee don't get me wrong but you know the bureaucracy to set up even a simple study these days is really takes a lot of determination and effort and most doctors in the NHS with busy busy agenda say well I can't be bothered to do that thank you very much no quite I think there's another aspect though I mean I'd be interested in your thoughts on this I think we've sort of taken the concept of evidence-based medicine to a position where evidence doesn't seem to you know seems to have a very peculiar sort of almost religious yeah. aspect to it. it it's, it's you've got to have done huge rcts that only pharmaceutical companies can afford to do for anything to be evidence and that seems to me yes missing the point of medicine oh absolutely right and, and that's come to the fore with with cannabis there's people who say you can't use this because it hasn't gone through the necessary panoply of double blind placebo controlled studies which is partly true uh, but that's partly true because cannabis doesn't lend itself to that sort of a pharmaceutical assessment it's not a it's not a single molecule single disease product it's a multi-molecule multi-disease product which just really doesn't fit in the pharmaceutical paradigm but you know it's sad i think we're beginning to see so-called real world evidence taken more seriously covid has actually you know, partly helped that but i remember i saw recently the harveyan how you pronounce it harveyan oration by professor sir michael rawlins I used to know, as he was a Newcastle-based pharmacologist, I think, wasn't he, David? Uh -huh. I think. He was. He was a clinical pharmacologist. Yes. In Newcastle. You're dead right. Yes. And then he joined the um, CSM, yeah. He joined the CSM and he was chairman of, or he's chairman of NICE as well, I believe. Is he still yeah. chairman of the MHRA? I'm not sure, but he'd be very senior. Yeah. Yeah, down to the end of last year, yeah. Right. Lovely guy. Very senior in those sort of uh, approval uh, regulatory spheres. And he made the case, maybe 10 years ago, I forget the exact, saying, you know, we shouldn't put double line placebo control studies on a pedestal. Let's look at other evidence, observational studies, case studies, real world studies, because not everything lends itself to those. That seems to be conveniently forgotten. And this was the guy then at the top of that regulatory framework. And the doctors, partly the doctors who now don't believe in cannabis, is because it hasn't gone through those pharmaceutical hoops. And it it will never go through those pharmaceutical hoops. So we do need a different approach to approving particularly botanical medicines. Well, absolutely. There's that. I think, I don't think there is a botanical medicine license in Britain. No. Because I, I remember when I was on the CSM, Hypericum and St. John's Wort was, yes. was essentially blocked, um, even though it's been three or four different formulations are available in Germany, blocked on the grounds that they couldn't get exact precision as to what the multiple different elements of the plant in each product were and yeah that did seem to me a, a little bit excessive a bit bureaucratic 
But then there's the other side of the coin, and this is this is where someone like you know Hannah and her and Alfie are at huge disadvantage. I mean, who is who is gonna do an RCT in a disorder like what it was PCD H19? I mean, when there may only be three or four, in the, can you even do an RCT when you haven't got any patients to it? You can't. There's, there's three boys. There's three boys. So it's genetics. I mean, it's mainly in girls, but it's exceptionally rare in girls, but it's virtually unheard of in boys. You just can't do any sort of meaningful study with three people. So it's, you just can't do it. So does that mean you're not going to, does that, that means then presumably you're not going to ever approve it in a pharmaceutical sense for anything other than the, the bigger diagnostic categories like Dravé or Lennox Gestalt. Well, that's right. And, and that seems to me completely against the, the, the whole purpose of medicine, which is yes. to try to help patients. I mean, I, yeah. I mean I, and I'm just wondering whether whether that it's just people understand that people who claim there should be trials understand that you can't, you can't, you know, there are conditions in which you can't do trials because, yes. and also who's going to pay for the trials? Well, exactly. I mean, pharmaceutical industry isn't interested in this, which I think is sad. And I think it's mainly because you can't patent the plant. Therefore, you can't make money out of it. You know, and I accept that. I mean, pharmaceutical companies have got to make money. That's how they survive. And you can't make money in the pharmaceutical sense from patenting. A, you can't patent the plant. You can patent bits of the plant like GW have done and good luck to them. But so there's not really been that investment for pharmaceutical industry. It will never happen. It will, it will never. If we carry on with the same paradigm, cannabis will never see the light of day in a proper licensed sense. So you think the, edu the solution is education, or do you think we should be trying to change the law some other way, or change the regulations? I think there's two or three different approaches. One is education of the doctors, absolutely. Second, I think, is education of the lay patient communities, because I think they can really influence this. Uh, if people know what they're talking about, going to there to educate the doctors. Now, some doctors will be happy to be educated. Sadly, some of our colleagues won't be happy to be educated by their patients. So I think that's a, the second approach. I think the government also, though, can do something. And what I've suggested in a, in a, a white paper that, that's coming out very soon is setting up, well, it's not an original a suggestion, it's setting up something like called the Office of Medicinal Cannabis or something similar, like they have in many countries like Holland, where you, you look at the, the regulation, the licensing, the evidence, the importation of cannabis as a separate non-pharmaceutical entity. You, you bring the expertise together and with the greatest will in the world, the expertise is not there for cannabis in the Home Office Licensing Department or the MHRA. There are some very good individuals there, but they, I don't think any of them would particularly claim huge knowledge and expertise of, of cannabis. It, it needs looking at from a different standpoint. That's what the government could do. So that paper is coming out. At, when is that coming out? Right. Uh, it's now coming out the week after Easter. It's a discussion paper for 10 recommendations for government, it's called. To do, and it's basically to develop the UK medical cannabis industry. So it's, it's various things like the several farmers in the UK who want to grow high THC cultivation licenses for, to grow cannabis. And there's been such a long drawn out process with the Home Office. Some have put their license applications in over a year ago. COVID hasn't helped that. So that's one aspect to it. It's also getting people, other GPs to prescribe, for example, is another recommendation. Yes, because people may not realise that GPs yeah. are not allowed to prescribe. It's only specialists, isn't it? And specialists are very hard to get to see. Yeah, GPs can prescribe under the guidance of the specialists, but they can't initiate prescription. I think it's a pity because many of the indications of cannabis are GP territory. You know, anxiety, pain, Chrome disease. Yeah, it's, it's, it's core work. for. I think GPs make very good holistic prescribers of cannabis. So the paper's coming out with 10 recommendations in total, but really all designed to make the case that we need a, a medical cannabis industry, particularly post-COVID, it will provide jobs for the country. We've got some mm. comparative figures with the States and Canada and Australia. Income, I never thought I'd be suggesting to the government a tax, a tax raising initiative, but I think it's far better to raise income from good quality businesses than put them in the hands of the criminal fraternity, to be quite honest. It will help supply chain because we're having all sorts of problems of supply from abroad. COVID hasn't helped that again, but you know there are issues about licenses from abroad. And Brexit hasn't helped. Brexit hasn't helped, definitely. So it's, I think we absolutely need a UK medical cannabis industry and we need to get it on the NHS. So the, the white paper, uh, the discussion paper is now called, is uh, designed to be widely debated and to, to further that argument. 
Well, that's very exciting. Congratulations. And uh, I'm not sure when this podcast is coming out, but if it's uh, if it comes out before the white paper, we'll be certainly be advertising and tweeting about the white paper on the website. Then you can claim an exclusive. <laughs> The white paper's out. Well, I'm sure people will have already read it. And yes, on for, yes. For pursuing that, yes. And do you think there's something about not being invented in Britain? I mean, because we've got enormous data sets from America. We've got millions of Americans taking medical mm. cannabis for decades. Yes. No harms are coming to them. And yet we still see, in this country, we still see the medical profession kind of almost until it's done in Britain, we're not going to trust any data from elsewhere. Is that part of a sort of British insularity, do you think? Yes. British arrogance? Yes. Sadly, I didn't think that existed to the extent I now know it does. But I mean, NICE, for example, in their cannabis resume, re rejected papers not written in English. I mean, they say that in the actual report. Papers written in German, you know, right. you'd think they'd actually be able to translate it. And I have to say, it's a bit of a negative story against the um, ex-chief medical officer who remained nameless. But when Hannah was making her case and calling the, giving the evidence from Holland, I said, well... That evidence is from um, Holland, isn't it? So we don't really, that doesn't really count. Actually, that was not, that was a professor of pediatric neurology at Great Ormond Street, not a chief medical, I do a disservice to the chief medical officer. But nevertheless, it's so, you know, we can't do anything unless it's British research, which you know, is 50 countries in the world now, Dave, have got you know, medical cannabis. 50? Oh, wow. I hadn't realised there was that many. Yeah. Wow. And many of those countries are producing very good quality work now. Um, Canada, particularly the States, part of the, the states where it's legal. Australia's coming out. Israel, of course, is very uh, influential in the basic cannabis research field. So, you know, we, we do need to look. And another one of the suggestions from the, from the discussion paper that's coming out was to reconvene NICE with experts internationally who've done this, who know what they're talking about, and can make proper recommendations about um, using cannabis sensibly. I thought the American Academy of Science did that a couple of years ago in that, they did. that rather large book. It's a very good book, American Academies, yes. Pretty good analysis. That was about 300 pages of detailed analysis, wasn't it? It was, you know, but that's apparently we can't take any note of that. It's because the Americans can't be trusted. And in the middle of it, it's patients that are suffering, and particularly the parents of these children who've got... Yeah, it's, yes, and they're having to fork out... It seems cruel. ...ridiculous sums of money. I mean, the cost is coming down... Uh, through and thanks again to T21 and your initiative through that is an absolutely great, brilliant initiative. And the cost is coming down, but those who aren't on that or before it happened, you know, they were forking out two thousand pounds a month plus, and there's not really anyone of any note in this country who can afford that. There's people who've sold their house, sold their business, they still do coffee mornings and raffles just to, to fund the medicine for their child. I think it's it's immoral, frankly. And it's not as if it's a trivial benefit, is it? I mean, the, the, the children are transformed. I mean, Alfie is completely transformed, you know, I mean, from, yeah, totally. from being in hospital most of his life. I mean, it's a, you don't kind of need statistical analyses to show that no. these children have been, you know, their lives have been turned around and, and, yes. uh, and the parents are paying. I mean, it's just, it's just like going, putting us back before the days of the NHS when only the rich could afford. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, Alf's life has, has been completely transformed. Uh, quality of life. And we shouldn't forget, even if we're not doing it for any, let's forget the patients and just look at it economically. He is, we did a back of envelope calculation and, you know, he was admitted, as I said earlier, um, 45 times the pediatric intensive care unit. That's about £3,000 a night. Okay, and the uh, cost of cannabis for him now is over £40,000 a year because it's artificially, ridiculously high because he's the only one on that in the NHS doing it, so that he's being, frankly, overcharged. But even taking that into account, he's saved, he's saved one child to save the NHS over £100,000 per annum. And if you think of those... Yes, and if you roll that out. Roll that out. Roll that out to those with pain who may come off benefits, who might get back to work, who may have less care re requirements, less opioid prescriptions, less prescriptions of other anti-anxiety drugs, everything else. Put all that together. I, I am certain you could introduce cannabis to the National Health Service at a net zero cost or even a saving. And what we absolutely need is a good quality health economic study to prove that. But I know that will be the answer. But people don't take any notice of me saying, I know that's the answer. You've got to actually do it and show it's the answer. Well, we're hoping that T21, our initiative to yeah. try to get a few thousand people prescriptions at, at a reasonable cost, uh, will help provide that evidence. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just tell the listeners that I'm really delighted that, that Mike has joined Drug Science as our, our lead clinician overseeing the training of doctors prescribing for T21. So it's been a, 
it's great to have you on board, Mike, and I think you're going to massively influence uh, the next generation of, uh, of prescribers. And, and one of the things I'm finding is that when I go and talk to medical students, they're really, really interested in this. Yes. You know, they they are interested. They can't they understand why their consultants are interested because they yeah. say, wow, this is a kind of revolution. Yes. And when we explain the utility and the breadth of disorders at medical cannabis, they're gagging to get into it. And I'm hoping, you know, that, that when they eventually get trained and we will have changed the rules to some extent so they can yes. properly work out what the benefits are. I agree. It is very much generational, I'm afraid. There's a lot of interest in medical students and junior doctors. It is, sadly, the senior medical hierarchy that is uh, rather reluctant. Well, they can't last forever, although, you know, I guess the problem with statins is it's over the mind. Yes, this is... <laughs> Anyway, Michael, thank you so much. It's been great conversing with you, and, and thanks again for everything you've done. I don't think I would be uh, having these podcasts at all, actually, if I if we hadn't set up drug science. And medical cannabis was clearly one of the main drivers for doing that. So, thanks for your work. No, it's great, and the, and well done. The T Twenty One program is is really, really wonderful, wonderful program that's made it affordable to uh, so many people now that couldn't afford it before. So, let's get on and uh, use that data to persuade our colleagues. Very good to be part of it. Thank you, Michael. Well, it's great to have you on board and uh, we will talk more. Thanks again. Lovely. Thanks, Dave.